I was always interested in flying. Growing up in Salinas, I had always had an interest. Ever since we were kids, we used to live out by the old airport. The airport had a lot of little crop dusters, and they were these biplanes. And so as kids, we would run over there and jump in and play in these biplanes. And it was a real thrill when I was a kid, like 12 years old. Guys I know would go up and take the uh, exam to be a, a, a Navy pilot, and every one of them failed. Turns out I was qualified to go in the Navy flight training. So Everett Alvarez, he's a Navy pilot, which is really unusual. This is an elite status. Um, especially for Mexican-Americans, but for any military man. He has an elite position. He is shot down. It's hard to find a family that wasn't being affected by the Vietnam War inside of the barrios of the Southwest at that time. Some of my earliest memories are, are of looking at the photo album of my dad from Vietnam. Uh, you know, I mean, this, this old tattered army green, you know, photo album and thumbing through it and, you know, it was something that we talked about and that we knew about. What does that mean for the community as a whole? when? war was such a part of their life. I think a lot of people look at the Latino community and the Mexican community and think that a lot of them are immigrants. And yes, there's a large percentage that are immigrants, but there's many that have been here for generations. And so in those generations, you had fathers and grandfathers who were in the American military. There's an enormous pride. There's this sense of hyper-Mexican American loyalty, a willingness to sacrifice and die on behalf of the United States. That Mexican Americans are not just patriotic, but they're better. It's like you think we're inferior, but ha, look at here, we're actually superior. And they can point to the meaning, the real sense of inclusion they felt as a result of their World War II experience. The most recent information is probably 500,000 Mexican-Americans served during World War II. In my parents' generation, they all served. There was a lot of gratitude for the opportunities that we had here in this country because my parents were born here, but my grandparents came here from Mexico. This was a very commonly understood obligation that we were going to be fulfilling, and uh, I knew someday I was going to do it, one form or another. What is really important to remember, just a decade back, the 1930s, we have so many people deported from the United States or intense anti-Mexican sentiment. And what that does is make Mexican-Americans feel extremely vulnerable. They are extremely vulnerable, right? They've seen their relatives deported. It makes sense that they're clinging to their American identity as a form of protection. They really need it. And then there's the, the experience of World War II as well um, emphasizes their role as Americans. The US government knows what it's doing. It has a massive propaganda campaign World War II is an extraordinarily immense effort that requires the participation of all Americans. So if the slogan is Americans all, that means even people who we might not have wanted to have here just 10 years before. To be able to serve in the military is like the ultimate proof that you belong, that you are accepted in a society. It just comes at the ultimate price during wartime. And so it is, um, it's a powerful and, and deadly um, civil rights strategy.
I got this draft notice and I'm thinking to myself, my friends in Berkeley are protesting. I don't know really what they're protesting. And in my soul, I want to see what war looks like. At 16, you have no idea who you are. But you want to have an idea who you are, and you choose these things that will give you the value of who you are. One of the most imaginary portfolios that can ever be handed to a 16, 17-year-old boy is the portfolio of hero, the warrior hero. An entire life handed to you. Not just a piece of a life, but an entire life. And the possibility of heroic death and heroic forever hereafter is handed to a boy. And you never have to make a decision again because you're doing something that cannot be questioned in our culture. Cannot be questioned. Once you're in there, you are, you are, in, you are in the sacred halls of honor. A lot of Latinos went in as Marines because not only they want to be in the military and prove they were Americans, but they want to prove that they were the toughest of the toughest. A large number joined the Marine Corps, as did my brother and uh, some of my cousins, because again, that's what they felt that would really show that they were a, a, a true American and a, and a true man. I, uh, I was also accepted into college, but I told them no. I wanted to be a Marine, as simple as that. I don't know if it was a foolish thing, but it was what I wanted. I wanted to be a Marine. When I was a kid, I would be training, doing push-ups and everything, because I wanted to be ready for that day, you know? I already had in my mind that one day if there was a war, I would go to that war, and I would die as a hero. Just on my street, I think there's only two people out of 12 houses that didn't have somebody in the service, or still isn't in the service or didn't go in the Marine Corps or Navy or Air Force, Rangers or recon or any of these other units. But everybody had a child or a brother or a sister or a cousin in the service. I believe this whole county was very patriotic. It's what more or less was expected of you during that time. Your forefathers went to the service. My father went to the service. It was my duty to go also. Their whole concept was, if you're an American, then serve your country. You're no better, you're no worse than anybody, but just pay your dues just like everybody else has. We also come from a very strong military family, which goes all the way back to the Alamo. My father said, once you came into this country, he says, you owe your allegiance to this country. And my dad said, don't you forget that. So if another war happens to come up, you boys will serve your country. For the better part, until the early 1970s, it was a segregated town. You had your Angles living on one section, and the Hispanics and Blacks were on the same street. You had a choice of either going to the mines, working in the fields, or going into the service. Education wasn't uh, too much of an option. Military service was an out for them. It was an opportunity for them. And many would join in 63, 64, not ever thinking about Vietnam. And then by 66, 67, suddenly they're on the front lines at Contien, or in 68 in Quezon, or around Da Nang, where the major battles are being fought. And they didn't anticipate that. When they gave you those exams in boot camp, you know, there's kids who couldn't read. You knew where they were going. I mean, they were going directly to infantry. The lower your education, the worse your English, the more likely you are to carry a gun into the field. 
and myself being a radio guy humping that radio I knew those crosshairs were always on my body somewhere you're scared I feared death I feared it the thing that scared me the most was artillery I don't know why it, it some it didn't bother some people or whatever but with me, it, it, it scared the dickens out of me. We were grunts. We saw firsthand a lot of action. We saw firefights. We saw people die. We saw our buddies next to us die. We killed people. There were a lot of Hispanics who died and who fought there, and who were sent to the front lines, who were sent as point guards. That's one of the most dangerous parts when you're going to a patrol. I couldn't understand why an African-American, for instance, who would be new to a unit, be sent to point without the experience that the other guys had. The American-born Puerto Ricans began to identify with the Puerto Rican-born Puerto Rican. I began to embrace my Puerto Rican culture and to be proud of my heritage. 